everybody. I'm all by myself today. It's weird not having Kim to look at and talk to and get things started. The last time I did this by myself, the keyword was flexibility after I put my phone on airplane mode. So this week, what's the starting place? We're going to do Q&A again. I can answer questions and just talk hi, Leaf. No sound yet. Okay, now we have sound. And so I guess the place to start is what I haven't talked about yet. And I found that out in Denver. In Denver, at the end of the day, we had one patient the first night, two patients the second night, one patient the third night that were very complicated. And the patient that came in the second night had a wonderful timeline and a bunch of diagnoses. And as we went through the diagnoses, since with FSM, the treatment is totally dependent on treating the right thing with the right thing, I stopped her as she came up with the first diagnoses. And I said, okay, let's pretend that diagnosis is wrong. So what symptoms do you have that depend on that diagnosis being correct? And how do we know? And all the way down her list, which was extensive, and all of the things all the way down the list contributed to a set of symptoms where she has trouble sitting up, problems with disequilibrium. She acts for all the world like she has a traumatic brain injury. And she said, no, I've never had a concussion. I got in one little auto accident, but it was no big deal. And then at the very end, 45 minutes into this wonderful timeline history, she said, I did sprain my ankle when I played soccer. How long did you play soccer? From the time I was, I think, nine until I was 16. How often did you play? Seven days a week? Class soccer? Yep. League soccer? Yep. Competitive soccer? Yep. Seven days a week for seven years? and somebody told you you haven't had a head injury? So with the history that walks in the door, sometimes they come in with a diagnosis that gives them comfort. I, I have this, and this is why I have these symptoms. So I think a couple of months ago, I talked about a patient that had ankylosing spondylitis for 22 years. But when you looked at her x-rays, which were done months before, she had no calcifications in her spine. There's almost no way for somebody to have ankylosing spondylitis for 22 years and have no calcifications. She had sacroiliitis. That's a given. Same thing with this lady. Nobody had examined her or assessed her for traumatic brain injuries. Somebody tell me how you can play competitive soccer 365 days a year for seven years, indoor, outdoor, and not get hit in the head. And what made you stop playing soccer? When I was 16, all of a sudden, all these symptoms started and I had to stop playing. Was there any one particular crash in a game that you remember? No. So I was taught to take histories by a neurologist in Portland named Robert Grimm. And he made it a habit. So I sent him all of my difficult, impossible neurologic patients. And I got to sit in the corner and watch him 
take histories and assess and treat patients. He said to the patient, we have to start over because if the person who gave you this diagnosis was correct and the patient and the treatment was correct, then you'd be better and you wouldn't be here. So let's start over. And that was the key. So when I talk in the core seminar about the key is always in the history and the physical exam, it's not the patient presents with or brings with them a chronological timeline. I, it, this happened and then that happened and I was fine until, and then one thing after another. They come with that, but most of the time they also come with a list of diagnoses that have been either treated or not treated. And I hear Bob Grimm's voice in my ear saying, if the diagnosis was correct, you wouldn't be here. And if the treatment had been correct, you wouldn't be here. So let's start over. So that's what I mean about the key to successful treatment is in the history. As the patient's talking, as Kim would say, you unpack it. So I have Kim in my ear, even though she's on a plane probably to someplace, you unpack it. So tell me about that time when, and I tested positive for Lyme. How many bands? What test? And if the patient was muscle tested or electrodermal tested for Lyme, we start over. They have to have a blood test that's CDC approved for Lyme. Same thing with mold. Those complicated kinds of diagnoses. Oh, goody. So that's, I don't know if that's helpful. I hope that's helpful. Yes, no, there we go. Hi, Maddie. All right, Patricia, complicated eight month old baby, liver dysfunction, lymphatic blockages, extreme food intolerance, COVID vaccine when the mother was pregnant, babies having problems, detoxify, body inflammation. Mm, okay, so, COVID vaccine, if we have the assumption that the vaccine was part of the problem while mom was pregnant, if you look at the lymphatics and the liver, so if you go back and look at the virus webinar, patients who came in during the first round of COVID were coming in in kidney failure, elevated liver enzymes, lung, heart, and then the month after that, they started showing up with brain stuff. Some males, the only symptom they had was testicular pain. So go back and look at the virus webinar. And if you look at the baby's symptoms, think about the vagus as being in charge of suppressing inflammation. The vagus is in charge of that. So the vagus is suppressed or turned down by infection, stress, and trauma. So infection, a vaccine, or the virus, getting COVID or getting vaccine has got bits of virus peptides in it. So I would treat the vagus with the six virus frequencies, 38, 41, 44, 56, 160, 189. There's six frequencies. You run each of the viruses on 0.1 or 00, zero. then you put a tissue with the virus. So for this baby, you would do the liver, you do the vagus first, the virus and the vagus, the virus and the liver, the virus and the capillaries, and obviously the virus in the lymph nodes, 63, and the virus in the lymphatic system, 13. That's what I try. Yes, you can run concussion in vagus on the child, but until you clear up why the vagus is off, it's not going to work. So I'd start with the viruses. Long COVID is the same way. Vaccine reactions are the same way. We had somebody with that parosmia that came to the seminar at night 
to be treated on that first night. That was the easiest thing to treat. So everything smelled like smoke. And that's parosmia. Anosmia is you can't smell anything. Parosmia is you smell cinnamon and it smells like smoke. And if you think about it from a survival standpoint, if you are living on the savanna or in the woods in hunter-gatherer times, what's the most important smell for your olfactory system to recognize? Smoke. So that's the one that's left. Everything you smell stimulates. Now I'm making this up. There's no evidence. There's no study. It's just in my, it's just common sense. So anyway, so we put a contact over the forehead, put one, I think around her neck, and we ran each of the virus frequencies. And if you think of where the sense of smell is, it's in the ethmoid sinus, and we have a frequency for that. I think it's 36. And the ethmoid sinus is very dense with capillaries. So we run the ethmoid sinus and the capillaries and all the virus frequencies. And at the end of, I don't know, 45, 60 minutes, and we ran concussion in Vegas and we ran virus in the Vegas. And the next night she came in without her mask. She was pink instead of gray and she could smell. Like at the end of the treatment, she could smell her hand lotion. So that was pretty exciting. So there's that. So go back and review the frequencyspecific.com backslash virus and then frequencyspecific.com backslash webinar. All right. Keeping us going. Maddie. Hi, Carol. Hi, Maddie. Refer to 72-year-old anxiety attacks in the morning that pushes him, whoa, wanting to suicidal by nine o'clock when he wakes up, grew up in a church cult, no change in anxiety in the morning, and I need to help him. He's my first person like this wondering. And just 40 and 89. Wow. So she has run concussion in Vegas twice, depression twice, PTSD, relax and balance, no change in his anxiety in the morning. Do me a favor, Maddie, go back and check what else happened. So is there any chance that he has sleep apnea? Is there any chance that he had a vestibular injury? 40 and 89, the other, only other patient that I had with crippling anxiety, air quotes, was an interventional cardiologist back in 2006, seven in there someplace. And he described having incredible anxiety and that had started just five years before. So he'd been in practice for 10 or 12 years. And then all of a sudden, this intense anxiety. And I was treating his gut and for some reason treated toxicity in the thalamus. So find out where he lives. Is it near an agricultural area? There's mold. So does he have carpet, water leaks any place in his bathroom? or where he sleeps because he wakes up with the anxiety and that makes him just want to freak out and leave the world. So try toxicity in the midbrain that worked on that one cardiologist. Try the frequencies for mold in the midbrain and the cortex. If he's got mold, I don't know if you have access to urine mold testing down there, but I use real-time labs up here. I don't know what sort of urine mold testing you have available in Australia. The only other thing I can think of is to ask him if he can sleep someplace else and see if he wakes up feeling the same after two or three days and unpack the history a little bit more. He associates it for sure. His mom passed away on a plane to come and see him. Doesn't it make you wonder? 
what else happened at the same time? It's losing your mom, especially with a history like his, is tricky. But I'd unpack the history a little bit and try no sleep apnea, no vestibular injury. He does play hockey. He's had this for 20 years. Mom passing five years ago tipped him over and the panic attacks were more constant. Wow. The other thing that we end up getting to is humility. You can't help everybody. It's always worthwhile to try and to be the person that listens and the person that tries to help. And what is it about nighttime that makes it awful? Had it for 20 years. So I guess ask what happened 21 years ago. If he's 72, he was 50 when it started. So what happened just before it started? And then five years ago, his mom died. And that tipped him over the edge. Okay, so the question, I guess, would be, what happened 21 years ago, 20 and a half years ago? That's always in the history. It's there someplace. I don't know what it is. What did he do for a living? Where did he work? Where did he live? He takes sleeping tablets to get to sleep and stay asleep. Makes me wonder. So then the next thing is look up the side effects of the sleeping tablets and see if anxiety is one of the side effects. I always think in terms of medications. I had a patient last week that had a fusion from L2 to L5, and then a second in 21, and then a fusion of L5 and S1 in 22. And then I asked her about osteoporosis, and she said, yeah, I had osteoporosis, but I started on this medication for osteoporosis in 19. And your back pain started in 20. And then the surgery was in 21. Then I looked up the side effects of the medication. And the side effects were bone pain, musculoskeletal pain, muscle pain. Can't undo the fusions. And she has disc bulges, but all of her pain is facet generated. And even the referred pain into her groin, if you look at that sclerotomal referral chart, the pain refers into a groin and that's the T12 L1 facet. So we treated facets and she came in with her pain at an eight and left with her pain at a one. So that's, we're hoping to avoid the third fusion because now they're talking about fusing her from T7 to L2. So it's always in the history. So look at the meds. I'm glad he doesn't have sleep apnea, but find the dates. It started 20 years ago. What happened 20 and a half? Okay. Citalopram, I'd have to look it up. Is that Celexa? I have to turn my phone off of airplane mode. Celexa, yeah, there's no way to get off of Celexa. It is the most difficult and a depressant to get off of. And the number one side effect is anxiety. That's hilarious. I'm sorry. But the common side effects are being unable to sleep or feeling sleepy, headaches, nausea. It doesn't say anything about anxiety. Helps lift your mood. You may notice that you sleep better and feel less anxious, more relaxed about things. Okay. There we go. All right. I, good luck. They are tough. And you must be getting good at this. Or the universe would not be sending these people. Have you got any data on the diabetes protocol that involved the adipose infection? No, but there's a published paper someplace about viral infections or viruses or infections being involved in insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is not just for diabetes. It's for any of us that have a little extra weight around the tummy. And there was somebody someplace that sent me a paper 
on viruses being involved in that. Hi, Jesse. Uh, usually can't make these podcasts. Just wanted to hop on and say hello. We had so much fun at the five day core in Denver. If you're a practitioner and you're listening and you haven't been to a five day core in a while, they just seem to be getting better. Jesse said, it rocked my world. And apparently I really needed the reminder to be checking everybody for vestibular injuries and hyperactive reflexes. I caught no fewer than six new vestibular diagnoses last week. And she has an FCOVD downstairs. Yay. And we had three patients with plus three reflexes and they were practitioners that were in the class. And one gentleman had two beats of clonus on his right foot and one beat of clonus. So you pop the Achilles and the foot bounces and at once is okay, but his right foot bounced twice. And that was a big deal. Fortunately, I had a PM and R MD in the class. And I said, am I reading this right? I've never seen two beats of clonus in a patient that comes in walking. So he was 40 and 10, reduced the reflexes more or less to normal, got rid of the clonus. 81 and 10, got rid of the increase in tone in his legs. Oh, Diana, successful bacterial cellulitis recovery. Avoid any embedded 40s in the custom care mode programs. He used immune support throughout the illness. Yay, he got better. Yay. Yes, 40 and 10 and 81 and 10 for the win. That's what we did in Denver a lot. Actually, we had two patients on one table. They were both 40 and 10 and we were short of machines. So we put them on one table, bundled them next to each other. They were both tiny and put a wrap around both their necks, wrap around both their feet. And we had two machines, one on 40 and 10, one on 81 and 10. And it was hilarious. It was so much fun. All right, Debbie Benden, client with degeneration of C5-6 and C6-7 segments, osteophytes with associated dysbulges contributing to bilateral neurofaminal narrowing through C7 nerve root stenosis. He's in so much pain from his neck into his shoulder. Yeah, it's one machine to treat inflammation in the nerve that goes wrap around his neck and then we'll do a sensory exam, the little pinwheel thing, find out if C5 is numb or hyperesthetic. Five, six, seven, right? T1. Speaking of which, we have a practitioner in the class in Denver. He was a chiropractor and he said, yeah, I've got a lot of thumb degeneration. And the, the very next slide was, it's almost never your thumb. So I wrapped a towel around his neck, handed him a washcloth and ran 40 and 396 for 30 minutes. And his thumb pain went away. We also ran inflammation in the periosteum. So inflammation in the nerve, inflammation in the periosteum and his thumb pain was gone for the rest of the week. Debbie had start with 40 and 396 and then do the supine cervical practicum, treat the discs and those little teeny exercises to get the multifidi contracting and see if you can stabilize the spine and get the bone spurs to loosen up. So supine cervical practicum with a precision care, treat the nerve from his neck to his painful shoulder. Once you get the neck to quiet down, you can get into his axilla and treat the C5-6 nerve root, the subscapular nerve and the subscapularis muscle and do the supine neck and shoulder practicum. It's why we do the practicums the way we do them in the core now. So we do the supine cervical practicum three times until everybody in the class has done it. And then we do the supine neck and shoulder the next day. And then we do the supine lumbar. And then after that, everybody's on their own. They get to treat whatever's in front of them. The first, the supine cervical practicum and the supine neck and shoulder <clears throat> are not for the patient. They're for the practitioner. 
supine lumbar because three quarters of the table will be visceral and the other quarter will be musculoskeletal for low back pain. Those are actually for the patient. And then the next, in the core anyway, the next four practicums you do are for the patient that's on the table. We are doing a two-day practicum in Troutdale this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, for people that have taken the core on video. Can practitioners take that? Yeah. So there is a refresher option for $400. Okay. So there is a refresher option. So if you haven't taken the core in, I don't know, the last three or four years, if you've taken it before three years ago, you can sign up for the practicum and choose the refresher option. It's me and Dr. Osterberg will be running that practicum. So there we go. It'll be fun. So that's what I'd try, Debbie. All right. Anybody else? Let's see. Patricia Parkinson's FUS. What's FUS? You got voice volume problems. I used all imaginable, but not for this tissue. Okay. FU. Patricia, what is FUS? Focused ultrasound to the brain. They heated up his brain. Oh, okay. And his voice got quieter. Okay, 988, I think, is the frequency for the basal ganglia. That's what we treat for Parkinson's. If they fried it, ultrasound creates heat, right? And they did ultrasound on his brain to increase circulation. I have no idea. Did the Parkinson's get better? Connection between the basal ganglia and the thalamus was treated, but did the Parkinson's change or the only change was his voice got softer? Ah, the tremor's gone. There's that. Ah. If you look at where the vagal nuclei is in the medulla, it shouldn't have gotten fried by the ultrasound, but the vagus nerve controls the vocal cords. So maybe try treating the vagus for necrosis and degeneration and trauma, increased secretions in the vagus. I'm not sure where they placed the gadget that created the ultrasound. Oh, you've treated the vagus already. Can't put tissue back that's not there. I have no idea why all of a sudden his voice would get soft. If the treating the vagus didn't work and you treated it for necrosis and degeneration, increased secretions, this is the part where during the core and the advance, there is some point at which you say, it's not like we know what we're doing there. You can try that and see. The basal ganglia is above where the vagus comes out, unless the ultrasound was applied someplace near the jugular foramen and caught the vagus where it comes out of the skull and heated that up at which point maybe scarring in the vagus as it comes out of that jugular foramen. And you could try that. I have no idea. Trust the force, Luke. Maybe the little bird will sit on your shoulder and talk to you directly before the thalamus. The thalamus is in the middle of your head. So it was above the ear, I'm going to guess. Above the ear. 
That's interesting. I've never heard of the thalamus being thought of as the source of Parkinson's. It's always, this is informational. I'll keep that on my list. So I don't know what to tell you. Look at the path of the ultrasound and the heat and see what's in the way and what else might have gotten creamed by the heat. Ultrasound creates heat. And go back to first principles, right? Sure, send me an email. I'll see if I can get to it. All the time I was in Denver, I didn't answer any emails. So that made for an interest. I got to sleep in the Denver airport. There was weather on the East Coast and the pilots couldn't get west. So my flight was canceled and the airport was just full of sleeping bodies because so many flights were canceled. So I found a little couch and I plugged in my CPAP and I plugged in my chargers and slept on the couch and caught my flight in the morning. That was exciting, but it made for an interesting next couple of days. Let's see. Any burning questions? Nope, nothing in the Q&A. Then you're stuck with just me talking. What else came up in Denver? The history questions were interesting, but then we had a bunch of questions on... Hi, John. John Miser, thank you for asking the question, because then I don't just to... She's 88, no pharmaceuticals, nerve pain from her butt to her knee, sometimes to the ankle, intermittent, it's facets, 78, it's not the lumbar plexus, it's not the myelin, not the nerve. My money, if you have her stand up and see there isn't, any nerve that goes from your butt to your knee. Pain that goes from your butt to your knee is almost always facet joints. So I'll have her stand up, have her lean forward, then lean back. And if leaning back makes it worse, it's a facet. So treat subacute facets. And if you have a precision, you can do it with just 40 and 157. It doesn't bother her to bend backwards. That's interesting. There's no nerve that goes from the butt to the knee. There are trigger points that go from the butt to the knee. Down to the ankle, that's going to be the glute minimus, sometimes glute medius. And that can be from an SI joint sprain or strain. So maybe... Try treating the facets. It can't hurt and then find out what happened just before it started. When did it start? What was she doing just before it started? And see what happens. Doesn't bother her to bend backwards. I'm glad you checked, but I'd still treat it. Maddie, patient reports stinging. Bone spur on the Achilles that's completely healed. But it's one thing I can't address is the stinging where the bone spur started on the calcaneus. There's scar tissue in the periosteum, and on the Achilles, there's a fat pad. Usually, stinging is associated with something tearing. So, scarring in the periosteum, sclerosis in the fat pad, sclerosis in the nerve, scarring in the nerve. But I'd still go with if you look at where the bone spur is. Try torn and broken in the connective tissue where the plantar fascia attaches to the calcaneus. The bone spur is healed. I'm not sure how that happened, but torn and broken in the connective tissue that attaches to the plantar fascia, the calcaneus, and scarring in the periosteum, torn and broken in the periosteum. I don't have a favorite frequency. I kind of muddle through it until I find something that works. That's the truth to be told. Even as many times as I've done this, I just muddle through treating things until you find something works. Cynthia, oh, I'm glad you love to hear me talk because that's what I'm stuck doing today. This is good. 
ran into a woman that had an untreated hip injury turned into a ball of calcium that had to be surgically treated. How long does it take for the calcium influx to develop into that kind of calcification? How do we nip it in the bud? Number one, what was the hip injury? Was it a bursa that got calcified? What was the ball of calcium? Was it inside the joint? Was it the bursa that got calcified? I guess it depends on inflammation leads to chronic inflammation leads to calcium influx. So the calcification of the bone spurs forms from either constant tension on the connective tissue or chronic inflammation that just is unrelenting. I'd say nip it in the bud is tell the patient next time don't ignore it for so long. Maddie, doing a case report. Yay. Yeah, Cynthia. She didn't say it was 2020 and she had a fall. She chose not to treat it. And so decisions have consequences. Been there, done that. And let's see if we can help postoperatively. Torn and broken if she had a fall. And then just remember there's 18 verses in the hip, nine verses in the shoulder, 13 in the knee. 18 in the hip and pelvis. That's daunting. There's a lot of them. And then most of the tendons that attach between the legs and the pelvis, almost all of the tendons except for probably the sartorius is flat. There's 77 as a connective tissue attachment to the bone. And the connective tissue attaches to the periosteum. And the periosteum is really well innervated. So that makes a difference. Cool. Let's see what else interesting did we do? Any other questions? Okay, that's all good. Let's go back to Denver in my head. We treated the supine cervical practicum even for the nurse practitioners and acupuncturists and everybody, I make everybody do it three times because mechanically it's the easiest. You just feel the frequencies doing the work. And that's the practicum where you find out that 40 and 94 does only one thing. That's quiet, the medulla, which is quieting the accessory nerve. There's only one thing and that is it relaxes the upper trapezius. And then once the trapezius is out of the way, you can feel the medial and posterior scalenes and they're tight. And we do 40 and 10 and that gets the scalenes out of the way somehow by reducing inflammation in the spinal cord. And it suggests if you anthropomorphize or give motivation to a biological tissue, that the reason the scalenes are tight is to protect the spinal cord because it's inflamed. So you reduce inflammation in the cord, those muscles turn to smush. And then the, that leaves the splenius and the isthmus cervicis and thoracis that are innervated by dorsal roots. So you treat 40 and 396 and those muscles get out of the way. And once those muscles are out of the way, then you can actually feel the suboccipitals. So your hands are flat on the table, you lift your fingers up and you feel the suboccipital muscles. And the lateral suboccipital, a little triangle on each side that holds C1 centered. The lateral suboccipitals have as their job in life to keep C1 in the middle because there's vertebral arteries that go through, the carotids are right next to it. And if C1 is sliding, those arteries don't do well. So the lateral suboccipitals, obliquus capitis, superior, inferior, and the RCP major. And if it's any comfort, it took me about 12 years to memorize those names. They are tight, in my experience, because the alar ligaments are asymmetrical, the alar ligaments have as their job to hold C1 centered. So to get those muscles to relax, you treat why they're tight. And they're tight because the alar ligament 
is asymmetrical. One side is longer than the other, and that allows C1 to either rotate or slide sideways. And it's once we treat 124 and 100 are torn and broken in the ligaments. I don't know if we're actually repairing the ligaments, but I do know that frequency combination alone is the only thing that will make the lateral suboccipitals relax. And you just sit there and feel them change. One side is almost always tighter than the other, and you just feel them soften. And it's any place from four to 10 minutes. Once those are soft, then you move your fingers to the middle and there's the RCP minor. It's the only muscle in the neck that runs vertical, runs just lateral to that dent. If you feel in the back of your skull, you've got a little bump. And then just below that, you've got a dent. And you go down just below the little dent and then you go just to the right and just to the left by about a centimeter. And there's this little muscle that runs straight up from the occiput to the posterior arch of C1. And that is the RCP minor, rectus capitis posterior minor. And it has a connective tissue slip that connects it directly to the dura. And if you have a whiplash injury or a fall or anything where your head whips back, and you crush that little connective tissue slip or bruise it or smack it, all it takes is a drop or two of blood and you now have scar tissue that is holding the RCP minor to the dura directly with that little connective tissue slip that is now scarred from the RCP minor to the dura. Now, if you were the cerebellum, would you allow the RCP minor to relax if that meant it would pull on the dura right at the level of the brainstem? No. So the phrase we use about the cerebellum is it doesn't notify you, doesn't tell you why you have tension headaches or why your suboccipital muscles are always tight. And it doesn't negotiate. So you can do whatever you want to your suboccipital muscles. You can be the best cranial, cervical, chiropractor, osteopath on the planet. And if the RCP minor is glued to the dura and the ALAR ligaments are asymmetrical, you can keep adjusting C1 more or less forever. And it's not going to change anything. So the supine cervical practicum is why we do it three times. It's the most important thing you're going to do for anybody with neck pain or headaches. I think in basketball or pool or some sport, it's called the money shot. It's just a slam dunk. So treat scarring in the dura and you visualize or imagine peeling the RCP minor off of the dura, lift one side, Wait till it softens, lift one side, let it down, push towards the ceiling on the other side, wait till it softens, lift up about half a centimeter, let it down. So I'm teaching people who are not chiropractors or osteopaths how to do this by just having them take their middle finger and lift up half a centimeter. And the frequencies always do what they're described as doing. So it almost always works. It's pretty amazing. Grand Junction, Carrie Bullock. Oh yeah. Sorry, we missed you too. I'm sorry not to get back to Grand Junction. That was pretty fun. I have a friend who'd like to help me with endometriosis adhesions. Okay. No, no problem. Crohn's. Immunosuppressant. Okay. No, I wouldn't think so. The thing you need to remember with endometriosis is to start with 13 and 77. That takes care of usually the adhesions between the peritoneum and the organs. So you start with 13 and 77, and then it, you palpate 
the organs and in your head see the anatomy and remember that the vagus nerve is like a spider web all throughout the abdomen so while you're treating scarring in the small bowel and sclerosis in the adipose and scarring in the ureter so 2017 she had a uti that spread to all systems hasn't felt well since then the endometriosis ovarian cysts elevated platelets, treat scar tissue, scarring in the arteries, scarring in the small bowels, scarring in the ureter, and just do it gently. Figure out what started the Crohn's and wouldn't not increase secretions in the vagus. Being on immune suppressants, the vagus has as its job to suppress the immune system. So I think 81 and 109 might be okay. 40 and 116, I don't treat the immune system at all when they're on immune suppressants, but 81 and 109 should be okay. Just remember in endometriosis, the endometrial tissue is 155 and it bleeds. So you're going to have 284, you're going to have blood clots everywhere and you'll have scarring in the endometrium. Even though you're not in the uterus, you're out through the abdomen, scarring in the small bowel, scarring in the ovary, scarring in the tube. And the ovary and the tube can be rolled over and glued or adhered to the bladder, to the uterus, on the left to the sigmoid, and they can pull the sigmoid over towards the middle, which is why or how the veins can be compressed if the muscles and the lymphatics are so scarred. And it's like my hands know how to do it. It's when I have the opportunity for students, and you notice I close my eyes, opportunity to show students how to do abdominal adhesions. You press and you feel for where it gets tight. Then you look down at what anatomy should be there and you run that scarring in that tissue, sigmoid, ovary, tube, bladder, uterus, and find out what softens. And when that stops softening, you switch to another tissue. And it's just honestly mileage. It, after you've done it 20, 10, 20 times, different patients or the same patient five or 10 times, then you get better. The important thing is at the end, remember to run 18 and 62 to stop bleeding. It's really easy to inadvertently pull a little too hard. And there are a lot of little teeny capillaries in the abdomen and cause a bleed, a tiny bleed. They're not going to hemorrhage, but it just hurts. Blood outside of an artery or a capillary stimulates class C pain fibers and they become painful. Finish up with at least two to four minutes on 18 and 62 and see how that goes. And remember in the abdomen, anything can be glued to anything. That's the tricky part. It's pretty fun. I love treating abdominal adhesions. We have four minutes left. I answered 22. Are we done? Is it really four o'clock? Any, anybody have? See you soon, Maddie. Yes, we'll be in Australia in, I just made plane tickets, October. And then we fly from Australia to Taiwan and then back to Sydney. And then we fly home in November. I'm so excited. Do good things. Let's see what quote don't know what to finish with. I, this is where I miss Kim. She always has such a good quote to end on. Change one person's life, change the world, do good things. I'll see you next week. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. 
No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.